Hello and welcome to The Family of Things, a podcast series where we explore ideas, life and how we live it. I'm Helen Shaw and in this episode I'm with an actor and writer, Mark O'Halloran, the creative force behind darkly comic and moving films like Adam and Paul and Garage. So Mark, Adam and Paul was released maybe 10 years ago and it started so many things for you. But I really want to start much further back. Ennis, what was it like growing up in Ennis? And did you always want to be a writer? Um, I came from a very large family and my father was a great performer. He used to perform at the Musical Society and he was also a singer at get-togethers and family get-togethers and a tremendous storyteller. And my parents had 10 children and... uh, You know, to survive in a large family, you have to perform in lots of ways. You have to make yourself announced or you disappear. And I think that that was one of the things that led me to performance. But also I found that the imaginative process that takes you to playing a role is the same imaginative process that takes you to a character that allows you to write it down. I just didn't know it at the time and it took me a long time to get there simply because also I think when you're from a largely working class sort of background in the countryside to say I'm going to be a writer is a very difficult thing because it's saying I'm stepping out of this or something. I'm, I, it's hard to ex- explain. I think it was the hardest thing to say that I am, I'm going to be a writer or I am a writer because it didn't feel like it was my right in certain ways. So it took me a lot. I know that sounds very strange, but it took me a long time to get to writing. And just in the family, that that family of ten, where did you come in it? I was number eight in the family, so I spent a lot of time observing them, I think. And I think I spent a lot of time taking that, probably internally. I have always kept diaries and I, I still keep a day diary every day. And I've also taken notes on things that I see. But part of me felt at the time that I was taking notes on, if I saw something interesting on the street, I'd write it down because I felt that if I forgot it, you were dishonouring it in some way, that you saw something that nobody else maybe saw. And if you forgot it, then it's gone forever. So I used to write it down. I'm sure there's a, an OCD thing about that. So I had loads of those diaries. I still have them, you know, I have packs and packs and packs of them at home. So they were a start, yes, for sure. And when the producer that produced Adam and Paul, he came to see a play that I had put on and he asked me, did I have anything by way of uh, a treatment for a film? And I had taken loads of diaries of having watched homeless heroin addicts on the streets of Dublin and I had taken notes on them. So I had this idea in there. So I think I was always practising, but taking that step into showing the material to somebody took an extra time. (laughs) And I'm just curious about that instinct to write dialogue, to write drama, because many of us, I suppose, grow up and even if we're scribbling it, it can become many things, poetry, fiction. What was the elements that drew you to drama and to script in that way of creating characters for stage? I think that one of the things was that that was my training as an actor. Like I always thought about performance and delivering dialogue and dialogue for me is, you know, it's very precious. And uh, I also, in my mind, I invent characters and I'm constantly listening to voices in my head as any actor I think is because they're listening to tonations and and the, the way that I'm watching people, the way people react in situations to kind of hone their own craft or or whatever if that doesn't sound too pretentious but that was going on and it was always about observing what people say and why they say it and so that's what I was after rather than lyrical descriptions of of situations it was always embedded in the short phrase that somebody would say that means a whole lot the words unpacking the character Mm. but you didn't start with acting there is this period of science where where you end up (laughs) taking a science degree. What was that about? Well, I didn't even finish, but uh, I think this part of my mind is very logical and this part of my mind that isn't logical at all. And I liked things like mathematics and I certainly liked science and I still do. I'm still interested in it. And so with an unthought out CAO form, I found myself in a science degree in UCG and I was I was incredibly lost in it actually it had nothing to do with me whatsoever and I tried my best for a year and a bit and I failed terribly you know and at that time to fail at university coming from my background was a big thing it was a big thing and I felt terribly sorry for my parents because their thing is wouldn't you just get Stick through it, it? just do and it I and see what happens I couldn't I was incredibly lost and uh, I did some plays with the drama society there and I subsequently then went off 
my uncle was working in Holland and he got me a job in this place outside Amsterdam where I lived for a year and saved a bit of money and applied to drama school. So that element of waking up and recognising in, in, in UCG yeah. that science wasn't for you, it was also realising that drama was. Yes, I mean, I did my first ever play there. I'd wanted to be an actor since I was about two, I'd say. But again, I'd never been on stage. I'd never, I just was fascinated with it. And I think a part of it was watching my father. In or the watching, Macado in the and Macado stage shows and like stage that. stage shows like that. They did uh, Deflator Mouse at one point. I remember him in that. I remember him in all sorts of shows. And I found it magical when I was watching him as a kid, you know. And then I also found it magical watching him singing at home or, you know, when his own family would come out. My dad's family, the O'Hallorans, are a great shower of performers and singers and they always have been and are very entertaining people. Storytellers. Storytellers, absolutely storytellers. And being able to coin a story, even to take a boring story and put a spin on it was gold as far as they were concerned. And you were listening to all of this in a big family and and watching. But that transformative thing, like I would have witnessed the same thing as say my uncle would have witnessed and he'd come home to the house and retell it only I'd watch him retell it, change little bits of it and it would become this magical story. And that was was fascinating to me. It's like Playboy of the Western world. Exactly. There's a great gap between a gala story and a dirty deed, as as, uh, they say in that play. So you were a great listener. Yeah, I think so. I mean, that's part of the creative process is listening, I think, of certainly observation is, but also listening to the way that people use words. I think it was Wittgenstein said that Art only exists. Maybe I'm completely making this up. I, I never know Sounds what this is true. Going. <laughs> uh, that, that art only exists because of the failure of language. That it's the gap between what we want to say and, and how we try to say it. It's, the, it's the, the disjunction between those two, what we need to say and what we're able to say with words. That's where art comes in. Because that's where the meaning is. That's where the meaning is. And, and I really like that area when I'm writing of finding people who are desperately trying to say something but have none of the vocabulary to say it. So I'm I'm picturing now someone in Amsterdam mm. who already has had this experience of dram sock and acting, is a good storyteller, is a character, probably social. And I'm wondering within part of the things that was happening then, was it also about coming out? Yeah, I mean, I went to Amsterdam and I had never I had never been to London except as a, on a school tour and I had been to Dublin on a school tour. So I'd never left Ennis. I'd never been on an aeroplane. I was 20 years of age. I think these days it seems so. And I moved to Amsterdam, (laughs) which is just ridiculous. And also, I had never seen pornography, for instance, in Ennis. You know, these things. And suddenly they were in the supermarket. They were... In the shop window. In the shop windows. And there was prostitutes in shop windows and there was people smoking drugs and everything. Now, the culture shock of that alone was quite alarming. But I also stepped into my first gay bar when I was in Amsterdam. And I remember I stepped in and I was so shocked by it because nobody was hiding in the dark corner. I was so surprised at it. And I remember I must have looked really surprised because this English guy who was over for a weekend turned to me and said, are you all right? And I turned to him and said, are all these people gay? <laughs> <laughs> and he laughed and laughed and laughed. And he just went, oh, bless, oh, bless, oh, bless. And that was the start of, of me feeling that you sometimes you put invisible boundaries around yourself and Sometimes an experience like a, almost sometimes a shocking experience, but an experience that makes you look around and go, actually, there's no boundaries. There's no boundaries, you know, around me feeling bad about myself. It's only me putting them on myself. And so I stepped out. And after that, I just didn't give a a damn anymore. I was like, well, you know, if you've got a problem with it, it's your problem, it's not my problem. And I I think that that was a great thing. And sometimes, uh, certainly Ireland at that time, you needed to step away from Ireland. Because maybe just remind us what year that was. That was 1990. So it was three years before decriminalisation. It was a world away. I mean, it's hard when I meet young gay men now or young gay women. When I say it was a very different world. I came back to Dublin in 1992, 1991 into 1992 was when I went to the Gaiety School of Acting. And I remember going into the George and I'd meet people there and they'd tell me their name was X or Y or Z. And then I'd meet them on the streets maybe afterwards and you'd find out that their name wasn't X, Y or Z. They had their gay name that they took on when they went to gay bars because they were afraid of their identity being found out. Or certainly, you know, the first gay pride marches I went on in Dublin, there was 200 people at it. Like, in fact, the the, the march used to culminate in the 
the square in front of the central bank. There were so few people that we didn't even stop the traffic on Dame Street, you know. So now it's 60,000 people. And there was open hostility. Then. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And in a sense, where something like Leo Varadkar coming out publicly now really didn't, nobody batted an eyelid. The, the Varadkar thing was interesting in that it suddenly was a, oh my God, I didn't realise. That's how shocking it was. That's kind of where we're at. But it was, there was open hostility. There was, you know, people were afraid for their safety. There was a pub that used to be on Parliament Street called the Parliament, which is a gay pub. And then it got taken over by a new thing. And they did the thing where they banned all gay people because they wanted a new clientele. And they were allowed to do that. It was fine. You know, it was cool. I think that what changed it was there was a generation who came along and it was, it was the post AIDS generation in a lot of ways, where the community had been devastated, especially in America, but also in Ireland with, when AIDS came along. And the people who had been through that and subsequent generations were like, enough is enough. I'm not going to take this anymore. We've paid our dues, you know. And just because you're a nasty person does not mean I have to live in fear. And I think that's really what's happened. And now, I mean, we're in a very transformed place. And in a sense, when you came back from Amsterdam with that openness to who you are and were and saying this is who I am you also chose to come back to Ireland well I never I never intended to stay away I mean I certainly wanted to come to Dublin that was for sure and I wanted to do drama training there but I also I wanted to be on the stage of the Abbey and I wanted to be on the stage of the Gate and I wanted to be on the stage of the Gaiety like these were things that I had thought were extraordinary places you know I'd studied sing in my leaving search year or the O'Casey plays and they all belonged in the Abbey and I, I thought if you could act in the Abbey, you'd made it, you know. When was that, that first moment on the stage in the Abbey? What was that play? My first moment on the stage of the Abbey? Well, I didn't get onto the main stage for a long time. And so the first time I was on the main stage, I did An Ideal Husband that Neil Bartlett directed in 2008. But the first time I was in the Abbey was in the Peacock in a children's show called Shea Mouse, in which I played a psychotic cat wearing a blue overall with red beading on it. And uh, it was a play that was written by Pat McCabe. Well, he would have a second cat. Would. And uh, somebody else was playing a cricket. And we ended up <laughs> kidnapping a little baby cat, I think, and torturing it. And a robin redbreast got eaten by a rat in it. I mean, like, kids were terrified. <laughs> but it was brilliant because this was, this was my Abbey debut. One of the things that's very interesting about your creative journey is this balance between writing and acting mm. and which do you love most I suppose? Well I think that they're two very separate processes I mean they come from the same place ultimately and all of the lead up the imaginative lead up to doing them is the same thing it's investigating story and trying to find a truth in fiction the processes are very different I mean I love a rehearsal room I love being with other people in a rehearsal room with a director getting up on the floor and having fun. And basically, I think that even if it's a very heavy play with heavy themes in it, it's about play. It's about trying to be unselfconscious and finding the truth of your character. And it's also about interaction with people and then setting it onto the stage, you know, even with the terror of that, the setting foot onto stage every night in front of a live audience. If you're on it, you can feel as if you're controlling a room full of 800 people and, and you can feel in control of them and delivering a story to them it's absolutely exhilarating like there is nothing like it and I, I feel like at the end of a, a really good performance you know in a good run of a play but when a, a night has been going well when you finish I always feel like something has passed through me like something has absolutely like electric like I feel very tired and the mind is a bit odd but it's like something has moved through me like it's it's hard to describe but singers say quite the same thing that when it works, there's, there is this transformational moment between you and the audience. And I always think that that's, that's the bit for non-performers, that there is always that envy. And it must be addictive as well, in a sense. It there is must incredibly be that you addictive. That. And then it's also very, it's very upsetting when it isn't working. Because like, you know, <clears throat> there's no faking it. There's you also, know when it's not sometimes there. you're in a play, it's not the part you should be playing and it's not in a production that's working and it will never work. And you have to get up for six weeks and do the play knowing that an audience is not connecting with you. And it's an incredibly lonely and upsetting place actually but I did Twelfth Night last year and uh, I absolutely loved it playing Malvolio and there was times when I came out that stage and I just loved it I mean he, he was a deeply conservative type man who gets offered something way above his station and it causes him to lose the run of himself 
But the cruelty with which they unpick him and eventually destroy him is, I think it's very sad. And I really enjoyed that whole journey of that character. And I just loved it every night. There was a lot of fun in it. But I felt at times when I was out on that, there was big, long sections that, that were basically monologues and I felt very in control of it. I also enjoyed when I did Dubliners with the Corn Exchange a few years ago in the Gaiety. And again, that was like just amazing words, beautiful stories. And there was there was one of them called A Painful Case, which is, I think, my favourite story from it. And I got to perform that. That again, there was nights where I felt in control of it. And that's that's a very special thing, you know. And we started talking about Adam and Paul in 2004. And yet, when I look at your work, I know there was periods, like all of us, of being lost when things weren't happening. And often it's when you look back at somebody's journey, it can seem these overnight successes and these incredible moments and there's this, this and this. But there was a period, in a sense, before Adam and Paul, where, where things were slower to come together. When did you meet Lenny Everson? I remember the very day. Johnny Spears, who produced Adam and Paul, was a friend of a friend of mine who had a theatre space that I wrote plays for. And Johnny came to see this play that I wrote called The Head of Red O'Brien. And he asked me, did I have anything by way of, of uh, treatment? And I had all these kind of diary entries about homeless heroin addicts. So I'd put together a small document. I might as well have written it in crayon as far as the rest of the film world would have been concerned. Because these notes were because you'd been living in Mountjoy Square and, Mount Joy, and observing, Parnell Street, watching, watching, and observing and watching. Listening and seeing and I'd seen some things that I knew held two things one of which was things that would be very funny like people falling over in slow motion or blah blah blah, and yet had a pathos to it that you know we shouldn't be laughing at these people and I thought that the difference between those two things happening at the same time was quite powerful especially if you're trying to put humanity into a group of people that people would like to tear the humanity off so I thought that was kind of interesting. And uh, I then wrote some scenes up and I brought them into Johnny Spears's office, which were on Fitzwilliam Square at the time. And Lenny was there and we were put together. It was a project for Lenny that he was developing. And Lenny and I talked. Lenny had read the scripts, the, the scenes that I had written. And he said he connected to a sense of pace within them, the gentility of some of the, the humour in it and blah, blah, blah. And the two of them said, well, look, why don't you, you know, we'll pay you a small bit of money. Why don't you write the script and I went yeah brilliant really that's terrific and I remember leaving the office that day going what the hell am I doing I've never written a screenplay and I wrote it vaguely out of sequence 10 pages 20 pages at a time and I'd send them off to Lenny and he we'd get together at his house sit around his kitchen table and laugh at what we'd done or find oh that's very humorous and blah blah and we slowly patched it together I mean I have 18 drafts of that script at home and although there was always a sense, you know, the things that didn't change in it was like I knew that it was going to be called Adam and Paul. I knew it was going to be set between sunrise and sunrise. I knew that they'd meet a baby in the middle. But beyond that, I didn't particularly know. And part of me didn't know that it was going to be made, you know, but that I was really enjoying the process of it. All right, Adam and Paul. Yeah, you're not freezing in that bag. No, it's pity enough, this. I mean, I only have my cacks on under here. I need something to wipe myself with. I'm not wiping myself with a potato bag. When did it become part of it that, that you were also acting? Well, there was a thought from the very start that I would, and then there was a thought, no, I wouldn't. And I wanted to kind of step away from acting for a little while. I, I felt that I was tired of it. And so I wasn't, and then Tom Murphy got attached to it. But I resisted it and I said I'd like to screen test for it and we screen tested me just to make sure because I wasn't sure, you know, I was so close to the script and everything. So they said, look, <laughs> look, this you have to play it. It's as simple as. And we, we did try a lot of people. And, and also I knew Tom for years and years and years. Tom was a partner of mine. You know, we went out for a long time and we had stopped going out by the time we were making Adam and Paul. But I think I generally did write the part for him. And also because we were... Tom and I were best friends always, even after we, we'd split up. And, you know, we were like an old married couple on set because I'd be like, Tom, would you just hit, hit, hit the, the, the mark is there. You have to hit the mark. And he so you, was... You did an unspoken language as well as a spoken we had one. A history. We knew each other. We had a history. You could tell that there was a relationship between those two characters on screen. And that's hard to buy. Would you wait till I get out of my sleeves? You'll go that way, there. 
there's no clue on that bit. Maiden will care to you. I feel sorry for them, we do. Hell. The Bulgarians have nothing they have. It is a film of love. It is a film of, of friendship. Mm. And in, in some ways, even without people knowing about mm. your previous relationship mm. with Tom, probably that is the magic in it, is, is that there, there is a real rapport and you are able, as the two actors at the heart of it, to carry this emotional journey. Well, I think there was also just a... We didn't have to fake the relationship. The relationship was there. It was a brilliant journey, actually, because we made it for Tuppence Hapenny and there was a real family feel off doing it. Lenny, he is sensational with actors like he is sensational with actors you feel very looked after and he gets brilliant performances out of people and then hanging out with Tom doing it was brilliant because I loved Tom you know up to the day he died I loved him and watching him be brilliant while we were shooting was extraordinary he arrived with this character fully formed and you know if you ever met Tom outside of his part in Adam and Paul, you'd realise that he wasn't that person. You know, he was a very shy, very middle class Dublin kid. He'd been to Trinity, blah, blah. And he just, he was very transformed in that part, I thought. And obviously you mentioned he died. And mm. he was, what, 39 at that stage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lymphatic cancer? Mm -hmm. I think it was um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. He died in 2007. He actually died the day after Garage got released, which was really strange. He was very sick around that time. It was very sudden. His death was very sudden and very shocking. And, you know, I had lost a brother when I was 22, I think. And I had lost my dad. But losing Tom was of a different order in lots of ways, in that Tom, I think, was my chosen family, you know. And to lose him so in such... I just thought it was senseless. He had a huge amount to give. I thought he would turn out to be one of the greatest actors that Ireland had ever produced. He was also a great crack to hang around with. I mean, we <clears throat> anyone who knew us knew that we used to argue a lot. <laughs> and we used to row, like, nobody's business. Blah, 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 blah. But, like, even when I get a bit of good news, the first person I want to ring is Tom. And knowing that he's not there still hurts a little bit. And I still have photographs of him all around the flat. And I'm still shocked sometimes. I get up in the morning and I'll, st I'll catch a photograph of him and it'll still be a, a bang in the chest that he's not there. And, and there was lots of other things about Tom. I mean, Tom was a deeply mysterious person. I don't think anybody ever fully knew him. He had a tendency to wander off and you wouldn't see him for a couple of weeks and then he'd wander back and he might have, he might have other friends, you know, but nobody would ever know. Or you'd see these... You know, sometimes in a bar, he'd have two groups of people that he'd be wandering between. And you knew that there are other, there are other sets of friends here that which I didn't realise he had. Or, I mean, also, I, I do have to say that although I miss him terribly, his family must be, you know, and are, you know, I know they're devastated by his loss still. And they're, for them, it's, it was really senseless, you know. His death, and I suppose like all losses, you've mentioned your father and your brother, they mark us, define us, and they're the visceral experiences which, which shape us. It's not to say that they're ever positive, but they do bring out elements within us because maybe that's that Leonard Cohen line, that that's how the light gets in. Mm. Since Tom died, I mean, beyond that journey of dealing with the grief, do you think it's changed you? How have you dealt with, with that loss, that grief? I don't think I dealt with it very well at the start. You know, grief is an extraordinarily strange experience to go through. It comes on you in waves. It can manifest in rage and deep depression or in inconsolability. Creatively speaking, I kind of closed down for a while after Tom died. I didn't write for about a year and a half. I did very little work, in fact, at all. I did a bit of travelling around. I felt that some part of me was gone. And that's really hard to pull yourself back up out of. Now I know that, look, there's nothing can change it. You've got to get on. You've got to keep on going on. And actually, part of it was returning to being a creative person, to acting again, to writing again, to getting films made again, to putting on plays again. It had to be. Life had to continue on. That's to basically go on. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By its essence, and you mentioned it yourself again in connecting it, is that it also brings up the whole loss of your dad. And even though it's quite different, mm. as you say, 
that sometimes each grief opens up all the other wounds and that. And your dad equally can't have been that old. Oh, my dad was only 63 when he died. Um, he died at home very suddenly of a heart attack. I think every man losing his father, it's a massive, massive thing. And actually, I was going out with Tom at the time and Tom was an enormous help through that. I felt, weirdly enough, I think I matured as a person through the death of my father. Losing him caused me to wake myself up a little bit. The loss of Tom probably destroyed a little part of me. Mm. It's a different kind of, I know it's it very... It strips something out. Yeah. Whereas the death of my brother when I was in my early 20s, I think it completely shattered me in ways. Like, I spent a long time putting myself back together after that one, you know, because I wasn't mature enough to understand what it even was about or... And was that cancer? It was non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, the exact same thing that... that and funny enough, I met Tom two weeks after I buried my brother and I was in a bad way and Tom sort of picked me up and helped me through it and he didn't want to tell me at the end that that's the cancer that he had because he knew that this, I mean all these things but uh, life is a way of being circular and darkly humorous at the best of times you know and ripping you apart just yeah, when you think yeah, you've yeah, found yeah, yeah. solid ground yeah but then I have been enormously blessed in that like I loved Tom and I knew that Tom loved me I knew my dad loved me you know I've had all these people in my life and also, death is inevitable. It is an inevitable part of life. We've got to face it at some point. The one thing that it often, as you say, your dad's death is often what happens with us when we lose our parents, but equally, when we lose people suddenly, if we do come through it, is to make us really open up to the fact that each day counts mm. and that we are passing through. So it, it does sometimes give us a sense of urgency. I know if there is... An element that it opens up to you is that idea of don't get comfortable, get active. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you have to. I mean, you can be closed down by grief at times and you've got to, you got to shake that off and you've got to stand up again and, and look out at the world and start looking into yourself. And I'm interested then as to how you're looking out at the world now because I know... You're not long back from Cuba. This project that you've been working on, which sounds fascinating, mm -hmm. is very different. Yeah. It's a whole new world. You, you've, you've made a film in Spanish. Yeah, it was, it was a strange one. The last thing that got filmed that I made was a TV series called Prosperity. And after that, funny enough, I was at the end of a creative journey. Like I was at the end. Myself and Len decided we weren't going to work together for a point, not out of badness or, or thing, but we needed to branch out from each other. And do different things. And do different things. And I had said what I wanted to say, whatever that was, even though it was very little, about those types of stories. And I'd, I'd had enough of them. And I was creatively at a loose end, so to speak. You mean after prosperity? After or? prosperity. Yeah. And it was just like, I wasn't sure what I wanted to write anymore. I wasn't sure what was relevant. The Celtic Tiger collapsed. Tom had died. And I decided I'll just go back to acting. That's it. I, I probably have finished writing. That's pretty much done. And I went back. My acting career was taken off again and I was doing bits and bobs. And then I'd had a meeting with uh, Paddy Brannock before and he had said, look, Cuba's a really great place. Why don't you... Why don't we go to Cuba and we can look at things over there and see if there's anything you want to write about? And I thought, someone's paying for me holidays. <laughs> I'll go. And we went over to, to Cuba and admittedly, it is an extraordinary place. It is full of colour. It is full of life. It is full of adventure and romance and difficulty. And, you know, the political system is broken there. To try and make ends meet is difficult. So, you know, people are busy. And culturally, it's extraordinary. Like, it's the music, the literature. It's a really rich place for a very poor place. And so I came up with this idea for a story while I was over there. And I wrote it up when I came home, and Paddy liked it, and Rob Walpole and Rebecca Flanagan, who produced it, really liked it. And so they said, well, go and write it. So I went over to Cuba for, I think it was nearly two or three months, and I lived in the centre of the city and wrote, which was... It must have been incredible. It was incredible, but it was also very difficult because I remember sitting down to write the first page going, what on earth does one Cuban man say to the next Cuban man? I don't know. So I literally went out onto the streets. I listened to people. Now, my Spanish isn't very good. In fact, it's practically non-existent, but I'd watch them. I'd watch what they'd be saying or how they interact with and each other. And their body language. And their body so language. So much more vivid. <laughs> Abs absolutely. You know, I went to boxing matches. I went to music concerts. I hung out on the Malacan at night, met a group of drag queens who looked after me, who were led incredibly mad lives, like, but great fun. And I came home from that 
ready to start writing. Uh, you know, I had to read every Cuban novel that has ever been written. I had to read all the poetry. I had to listen to all the music. And I constructed the story. Now, it took about 10 months for me to do it, which is the longest I've ever spent on a script. It does sound like a nice 10 months, though. It was nice, only I, I, I was filled with doubt about, like, is this ridiculous? Is this like an Irish film? You know, is it going to end up being like an American coming over here and making an Irish film, like me going over to Cuba to make a, a Cuban film? People reacted very strongly to it, but it was difficult because it was going to be made in Spanish and blah, blah, blah. So it took about three years to finance. So that was an interesting one. At the same time, I wrote a play. I finished the screenplay on a Monday and by the next Friday, I'd written a play called Trade at the same time. So I, something unlocked me. I, I, was, I was writing again, which was kind of interesting. And Trade is, is the story of a rent boy. Yes. Yeah. It's the story of a man who believes he's fallen in love with a rent boy, a married man. And it's not necessarily for the sex or the sexuality of it, but he himself has lost his father and he's looking for wonder in his life and this boy represents something that's completely outside of his own experience. And I think it's the beginning of the man's persona or life fracturing and falling apart. So the play went on at the Dublin Theatre Festival and did very well for us. It was done site-specific in a small B&B room. I was incredibly proud of it and, in fact... I've written a screenplay of it now and it's going to be filmed this year, I think. And in some ways that journey from trade into the Cuban film... Mm. They were, they're, very, they're very alike in and loads of the, ways. what is the name in English or Espanol in the Cuban film? It's Viva. Viva? Yeah. It's great, we can all get our head around that. Yeah. The story of, of Viva is about a boy who... He's lost his mother who he lived with. He'd never had any contact with his father. His mother has died and he performs in a drag club. He's a young gay boy and he works as a hairdresser for old ladies in his neighbourhood. And his mother, when she died, had left him a record collection that they had together of old 50s and 60s Cuban divas singing beautiful Cuban love songs. And he listens to those. Unknowns to him, the record collection was given to his mother by his father, who had found them in a skip one night when he was coming home drunk. And one night he's performing anyway, in the, and he performs these love songs that his mother had left him in the drag, in club, the drag club as a drag character called Viva. And Fantastic. he's performing one night and there's this man and a lot of the drag queens there are working as prostitutes as well and they're perhaps suggesting that that's a way for him to make extra money and make life easier for himself. And there's this man staring at him and he kind of delivers this beautiful love song to this man and the man drags him off the stage and punches his head in and it's his father who has returned, who's been released from prison and is dying and has nowhere to live and has come home. And the boy has to care for his father. And they're thrown together in this very extreme circumstance. His father's alcoholic, hyper-violent, incredibly difficult. And through a record collection and through a mutual love of these songs, they grow to love each other. So it's, it's very high concept. It's almost a musical. It sounds like an opera. There is elements of that. I mean, it certainly is musical. Like, it has numbers in it. What is the song he's singing at that moment? One of them is an Elena Burka song. And there's one, uh, Sombras which is a song by Blanca Rosa Gill, who's a Cuban singer, and it's beautiful. Cuando tú te hayas ido, me envolverán las sombras. Cuando tú te hayas ido. And this idea of Cuba and the storytelling of song and its history through it has edged its way into the film, I think, because you're talking about a singer, a diva, who, in a sense, didn't fit into the political regime. Well, I think a lot of the, the, the women who had sung in the cabarets and in the casinos <clears throat> were seen as being anti-revolutionary when the revolution came, and a lot of them left the island because their careers would have been curtailed. So Elena Burka went to Miami. Uh, La Lupe, for a while, ended up in uh, homeless in New York. There was a whole string of them, and their stories were incredibly interesting. Elena Burka died, so they say, of HIV, of AIDS complications in Havana. She, she contracted HIV when she was in Miami, and she went back to Havana to die. And she wasn't allowed to sing, but she used to go out onto her veranda and sing to people who used to gather on the street. I mean, she's revered, absolutely revered on the island, and uh, she's not very well known outside of Cuba. But those women's stories on their own are incredibly interesting. Uh, 
And so we've kind of tried to bring some of that element, that taste of that into it. To be true to it as well, which yeah. is that idea of well, their giving love songs, life to them. Their love songs are also really interesting. Cuban love songs are full of, I tore the door from its jam it's and I threw you out of the house and I broke all the windows. And they're full on real high drama songs. So that's very interesting. And in, in a sense, in thinking about your work, whether it's from Adam and Paul to Viva, it makes me think of that mix between, say, Buster Keaton and dance and mime and stage, because your performance and, and what we see about what you do in your work is very physical. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah. And that's a key part of your relationship to the stage and maybe to communication, that, it, that it's, you use the body as a dancer as well. Well, I worked for a long time with the Corn Exchange, who are a theatre company here in Dublin, with Annie Ryan, who's the head of that. But she's a, an incredible teacher and she makes you inhabit your body. And because the Abbey has been unashamedly a literary theatre, there's a lot of words going on and there's a lot of people standing still delivering words on the stage. She makes you inhabit your body. She makes you say every word with your toes you know, from your head to your toes. And I found that training to be extraordinary. I also love dance and I like the way that the simplicity of a hand gesture can say more than five sentences can say. And I think that that's worth exploring. With my own writing, people say that my own writing is spare, um, that my scripts are quite spare, but it's only because I go through it and I go, well, there's no need to say that line. Why would you say it? Show it. Yeah, exactly. If he coughed there, it would be more than saying, I am very sick, just cough. You know, don't overtell anything. You know, sometimes we talk, but we're not actually saying what we're actually meaning. And I think that's one of the things that I also learned is that the words in a scene are not about what the scene is about sometimes, because we rarely are able to say what is worrying us, because sometimes either we don't know or we're afraid to say, but we do let people know. In between the lines. In between the lines. So that's the kind of drama that I'm interested in anyway. But where you are now, there is one story that, that has fascinated me, which is your relationship with Iran. Yeah, 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 yeah. How did that come about? People kept telling you you look like the, the Iranian Tom president. Tom Murphy used to tell me that I looked like Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Um, <laughs> it's just kind of funny. Uh, and I do, I don't look unlike him, although he's With a much beard. smaller man and uh, he's no longer the president of, of Iran. But he went on the television in 2008 or 2009, maybe, at Columbia University. And he said that uh, there's no such thing as a gays in Iran. And it incensed me for one reason, because they've killed 4,000 homosexuals since the revolution happened in 79. So you kind of go like, actually, who is it you're killing then? And then there had been the famous case of two 16-year-old boys who'd been hung. So part of me felt like, you know, I had a bit of money at the time, and I thought, oh, why don't I go to Iran and just see what it's like? Part of me was wondering, would there be gay people there? And so I headed off on this jaunt over to Iran and I hung around for about six weeks or something. It was extraordinary. It was just an extraordinary place. Because you really liked it. I love Iranian people. Like, I absolutely love them. Now, there's, a, you know, they, they have a great disjunction between their government and themselves and life like is very much... Like a lot of much, places. Exactly. They very much live their lives in private spaces, in home places, and because, you know, women have to cover up if they go outside, blah, blah, blah. The kindest, the nicest, the most friendly people that I have ever met. Also, the culture is extraordinary. Like, Isfahan... They call it half the world. If you go to Isfahan, you've seen half the world. It is just the most beautiful, beautiful place. I felt very looked after. I never got ripped off when I was there. People were genuinely kind and nice. When I was in Isfahan, I was sitting on the side of the street one day and this man came up to me. He was maybe a little bit younger than me. He was with his wife and a set of in-laws. And his wife, I could see his wife. I was sitting down looking through the Lonely Planet to see where on earth I was. And his wife had obviously told him to come and see was I all right. And he came up and he spoke English and he said, are you OK? Are you lost? I said, no, I'm actually just looking around. He goes, where are you from? I said, I'm from Ireland. And he was like, oh, my God, I have always wanted to meet an Irish person. <laughs> so I said, why? And he goes, I love James Joyce. And privately, he studied James Joyce at home. But he was entertaining his in-laws and his own parents. And he said, look, how about we meet in two days time and myself and my wife will throw a dinner for you. And I said, absolutely fine, but you don't have to, you know, it's okay. Two days later, he came and collected me in a taxi from the middle of Isfahan and went out to his home. And he said, I have a set of questions I am just dying to ask you. Can I start in the taxi? And I said, okay. And his first question was, who is the Lady Gregory? <laughs> what was the Celtic revival? He had read 
everything. He was privately translating Ulysses into Farsi at home. Fascinated with Ireland. So we had a, an absolutely brilliant night. Him and his, his wife was a, a miniature painter. She was a miniaturist. She painted on camel bone. Like they were really extraordinary, extraordinary. I'm still in contact so with those people. So cultured. He, you know, he's fascinated with Irish culture. But also the, the street that the British embassy is on in Tehran is called Bobby Sands Street. And if you go in, if people ask you where you're from and you say Ireland, if they're of a certain generation, they'll go Bobby Sands. Bobby Sands. And if they're of another generation? If they're of another generation, they have no idea who we, where Ireland is. Or they, they'll know. You they'll too. know vaguely you too or blah, blah, blah. But uh, the older generation certainly felt that we were fellow revolutionaries in some sort of way. But yeah, I had an amazing time. I went all the way down to Yazd in the desert. and Did you find gays? I certainly did find gays. <laughs> there's lots of, there's lots of, of gays in, in Iran. You don't even have to go looking. Like people would, you know, not proposition you, but they'd know that just by the gate of you that you were a bit gay and uh, <laughs> and I'd know by the gate of them that they were a bit gay and we'd sit and talk and and it's, uh, sometimes I'd get around to talking about their life and how their life was. So did you get a sense about how difficult that was I given think our is, own past where we started with yeah, this? What their, was their, their life? life uh, you know, there is a total disjunction between the idea of living out, open, happy gay life. It's Some of them will have a boyfriend but they, they would have to be incredibly careful of it. I mean incredibly careful about it. The younger people, you can s- even see that there's some sort of opening up going on there. But when you're dealing with extreme religious prejudice, it's very difficult to get beyond, you know. I'd say a lot of them are looking towards leaving, towards you know going to study in Europe or blah, blah. But I don't think that's going to be very easy for them in the, in the coming years. So there was a bit of it. I mean, I went to a couple of gay parties when I was there, which sounds ridiculous. A couple of gay parties in Tehran. You know, there's definitely a film in that. There definitely is, but you know, you have to be careful about exposing people's identity, etc. as well. What's the future holding? Well, I had a very busy year last year, work-wise. I played the lead in a film with this Dutch artist called Fiona Tan, and she's a video artist, quite well regarded in her field. So I made this very, it's quite an art, it's unashamedly art house film. What's that um, called, Mark? It's called History's Future. It's coming towards the end of its edit. It's about a man who gets beaten up and it causes a bleed on his brain and he loses all memory of himself or who he was. And he wanders, he just wanders through Europe. Some of it was filmed in Athens and Barcelona, Leipzig, Berlin, Paris, London and then Dublin. That so it was like a, a great gig. It was an amazing gig, amazing adventure. I got to act with Dennis Levant, who is one of my favourite actors of all time. He's this French actor. In French, I had to learn my dialogue off by heart in French. It was terrifying, <laughs> terrifying. And you're doing Shadow as I'm well. I'm doing Shadow, Shadow of a Gunman? Gunman in the Abbey. We're doing a month in the Lyric in Belfast and then seven weeks down in the Abbey during the summertime. That's which is, pretty big. It's big, playing Donald Davern. It's classic O'Casey okay, play. Donald Davern never leaves the stage for one second of the play. He's on all the time. I think we're going to play it without an interval. It'll be a big job. Wow. It'll be a big job. And I'm really looking forward to it. So, very creative period. Lots of yeah. things coming together. Extreme influences from mm. across the world happening there. Yeah. And is there a sense for you that this is a moment of fruition? That there's been a period maybe where you have been dealing with a lot of personal stuff including yeah, Tom's death. Yeah. There was there was a lot of there was a time when I went very quiet and I didn't have much to say and I didn't force it in that way. And then I wrote, you know, when I wrote um, Viva, it took time to get it made, so there was a bit of stepping back. I did a lot of acting in between all of that time. Well, maybe once or twice a year, but I did spend a lot of time reading or traveling or thinking about things or deciding what it is I wanted to do. I certainly, you know, as a writer, I'm not a commercial writer, as in I don't take on a job because I have the skills to do a three-act structure and something. I write something because I I feel that I've got something to say, but if not, then I won't do anything. And curious about who you admire, not so much even within your family or circle, (laughs) but in your art, um, who do well, you look to? The writers in Ireland, I mean, there's tremendous writers. There's Macpherson and O'Rourke and all of those, and I love them and I devour all their work. Murphy, though, Tom Murphy, the playwright, is by far and above, he's the greatest writer that we have for drama in Ireland. I mean, his work is extraordinary. That darkness comedy there as well, that Absolutely. ability to look at a moment and see the depths of despair and yet the moment 
of you know there's this this Balya Gangara and someone asks one of the women in it you know who's the father of the child that she's carrying and her reply to it is I have my suspicions and I just that line I was like oh my god that is so absolutely brilliant because um, it's that ear he yeah. has that and it's the fieriness of it and the defiance in utter despair as well like for that line alone he should be recognised as the best um, film wise I love Bergman I've watched all of Bergman's films just they knock me dead like they're just fantastic um, and that's that aspect of less words less words really all pulled happening back. within the moment there's a certain amount of family drama goes on he certainly is very uh, you know he very carefully watches relationships. Not so funny. Not <laughs> so funny. This is true. And I do then like slapstick comedy. I love Laryn Hardy. I've always loved Laryn Hardy and things that come from it. I love Samuel Beckett because of its vaudevillian influences, etc. I think the work is very funny, the Beckett's, uh, except when it goes really dark. Um, I suppose it's that question again of the balance. I mean, it sounds that writing, beyond the fact you'll continue to do both, that writing is certainly... Writing at times has a certain heft to it that I like. I feel that I'm probably doing something at a deeper level when I'm writing than I do when I'm acting. Part of me as an actor, I'm a bit of a song and dance man at the best of times. I love a big number. I love throwing shapes. And also, I like being funny on stage. So that can sometimes seem having less depth than the writing. But the writing, I, I feel that I try and go with places. I mean, the worst about the writing is that you sometimes fail there's sometimes you just have to leave a script go and realise you didn't get there. And that's always a bit hurtful, but sure. We started talking at the <coughs> beginning about being gay in Ireland mm. and obviously being at this moment of the marriage referendum mm. and how things have changed. From your perspective, what does that mean for you? Is marriage, is that something that you would see as part of your future? I am hugely in favour of the marriage equality referendum. I hope desperately that it'll pass. I have my doubts that it will. I feel that sometimes asking a very, very, very large majority of people to grant rights to a very, very small minority is a difficult thing to ask. And I think that a lot of people will get into the polling booth and they will go, this is nothing to do with me. Why, why, am, I, why am I voting for it? Why do I? No. And I don't think that they're doing it out of badness, but I think they'll do it out of a sense of confusion and also a sense of why am I changing what is mine for somebody that I don't know? Why am I doing that? And I think that the No campaign will play on that. They will play on confusion. They will play on blah, blah, blah. If you're not sure. If you're not sure. Say no. Say no. And they did it with the divorce referendum you know, a few years ago. I will do my damnedest to make sure that it passes. Whatever I can do in my own capacity, I will do what I can. I will argue it out on Twitter as much as I can. I will. Because you are big on Twitter. I love Twitter. I absolutely <laughs> love Twitter. And I do have to confess that's how we've met. If uh, yes. We, if, we, if, we, if you could say you meet on Twitter. Yes, I absolutely love Twitter. Now, it can become very dark at times and people become very angry and become very vexed. Have you felt that? Have people come back to you with that awful nastiness? That oh, yeah, yeah, you, you get it, you get it, yeah, yeah. Especially if you're... Over the marriage referendum? The marriage referendum, there have been arguments. I tend to, if anybody starts becoming, like, really offensive, I block them because you can't be putting up with that in your life. But I watch them. I watch what they do and what they do apparently in the name of religion or their own religious beliefs and it's denigrating other people and being nasty and you know that religion has nothing to do with it there's somebody with just anger issues because I'm not anti-religious my family, I was brought up a Catholic my mother is a practicing Catholic a minister of the Eucharist she's voting yes she's got three gay children and she loves her gay children she has three gay children? yeah, 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 yeah. my brother and my sister are also gay, yeah there's a whole clatter of us. <laughs> you know. That, is that, I suppose you work out the maths of having 10 children, there's a ratio, but like, that does seem unusual. I know a lot of people with gay siblings. I know a lot of gays with gay siblings. It's much more common than you would think. Than we think. Coming back to that question, which you neatly sidestepped there, I suppose when I meant about the marriage referendum, how, what does it mean to you personally? Uh, personally? Love, marriage, children. Um, I personally don't want children. I've never wanted children. I think if I was straight, I wouldn't want children. It's just not in me. I don't want, I'm not taking on that baggage. 
Uh, I went to babysit my friend's dog and I remember him looking at me as I was sitting on the couch. I was going, what? What do you want? What do you want of me? I can't give you anything. So I thought if it's a child, can you imagine? Um, And so that's not part of me. But as to whether I'd get married myself, you know, down the line, you know, you never say never, but the clock is ticking and I'm a single man. But for you guys, that clock ticks for a hell of a lot longer than those girls. (laughs) It sure does. It it does. And we live in hope. I just, (laughs) I just think... That possibly, possibly I'll never get married. You used a word once, which often is, is the same with a lot of creative artists, which is you called it selfishness, mm. which in a sense you're, you're on your own creative journey. And in some ways, maybe that also defines how you see your ability or your desires to end up in, well, a, in a, a family, whether as, as a parent well, or I a husband. Well, I think that all creative people use their selves and their own lives in their work. And then usually they work for longer than they should be you know they work long 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 hours and to use the material of your own relationship it's a very selfish thing to use your own family life but it's what you have to do you know if you're writing the truth you can only take it from where you're from yourself and your own experience of life and so you're taking bits of your life and to have somebody in your life and then to say well I'm going to actually use that thing you know it's difficult I I went out with somebody once and I I played them on stage (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I used them in a devised phrase. I got, used to get very annoyed with them over certain things. And I, I took a certain aspect of them. And they came to see the play and they were like, that is me, <laughs> you absolute um, effer. Were they offended or impressed? We laughed about it, but yeah. it could have gone either way. Yeah. And I, I and actually I learned a, a lesson out of that. You can't be doing that. Not if um, they're ever going to turn up. In the not audience. if they're ever going to turn up. Not if you're still going out with them. Um <laughs> Don't do that. But uh, but also I have used my own family life in plays or I have used my own experience in films yeah. and blah, blah, blah. Not direct things, but... Elements. Elements. Elements that would be recognisable, I think, from people. And I think that that's difficult. Sometimes there's a very big balance to get right when you meet somebody about how much does the work take precedence and how much does your life take precedence. And I, I don't know whether I've ever gotten that balance correct. Proudest work. Finally, what would you see as being your happiest to have created and done? Um, I think I think it would have to be Adam and Paul. Adam and Paul has a very special place in my heart. It was a culmination of a time with me and Tom. It's saturated with everything that we'd gone through as kids together, basically. It's also survived. Some films, they become less relevant as you go along and they disappear, or some works of art or whatever. But it survives. It's a really strange film because I meet people in England now who go, oh, we got shown that at film school the other day. Or it's, it has a little life of its own. Not a huge life, but it has a life. And the amount of people who've seen it in Ireland is <laughs> huge. Like, and I think it's had an effect on people. And I'm really, really, really proud of it. Garage is a stranger one in that I have a very strange relationship. It opened around the time Tom died. I never got to enjoy it as a film, although I know that it was a good film. I don't have an emotional relationship to it. But Adam and Paul stands there. I mean, I'm sure there'll be others down the line, but I think Adam and Paul will always have that place in my heart. Marco Halloran, thank you very much. Thanking you. been listening to the family of things a podcast series from athena media productions if you'd like to find out more go to our website thefamilyofthings.com 